Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mark, should I start? Yeah, please. Okay, very good. So um, it is my pleasure to chair the Saturday morning seminar that will be given by Professor Johan Mannart. And maybe let me start by shortly introducing Johan Mannart. Uh, Johan is a director at the Max Planck Institute for, of Solid State Research in Stuttgart, where he's leading the department solid state quantum electronics. Johan studied physics at the University of Tübingen, receiving his diploma in 1986 and his PhD in 1987. Johan, you will have to explain this to me later. Uh, he then worked at, uh, as a visiting scientist at the IBM Watson Research Center in Yorkton Heights, close to New York, and um, as a research staff member and manager at the IBM Zurich Research Laboratory in Hüschlikon, close to Zurich in Switzerland, uh, at the time when Daryl Schlamm was uh, also there, and uh, Daryl, I think, was a postdoc with you, uh, Johan. From 96 to 2011, he was a chaired professor at the Center for Electronic Correlations and Magnetism at the University of Augsburg. Uh, he uh, then became a Max Planck director in Stuttgart. His research interests focus on the properties of interfaces in complex electronic materials. Uh, Johan is famous for his work on bicrystal ITC Josephson junctions and squids, the enhancement of critical currents in ITC superconductors by grain alignment, which is uh, the technique and the basis for modern ITC superconducting cables. And let me also mention his more recent, very important contributions to the conducting and superconducting interface, which was formed between lanthanum aluminate and strontium titanate. The, the list of, of his achievements is, is very long. I'll stop here uh, by mentioning that Joran has received numerous awards for his research, including the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize of the German Science Foundation and the Europhysics Prize in 2014. And finally, I think this is well known now, please do ask questions using the chat and I'll give you the word at the end of the presentation. Joran, with this, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And thank you very much for your very kind and, and flattering words. Um, <clears throat> yeah, today in this lecture, um, I'll present some um, current research um, that has emerged um, from um, studying the effect of uh, um, the behavior of oxide interfaces. And I'll introduce um, some amazing properties. Um, first of all, um, emerging at these interfaces, but I'll also show that these properties, the signs that we have learned um, at these interfaces are not confined only to interfaces, but they um, actually um, are very general properties, very fundamental properties of nature. So I apologize to the organizer of this very nice summer school that my talk will be uh, focusing on emergent electronic states um, at interfaces, but these are not confined. And I hope that Mark will forgive me um, for this. So here's the, if I can manage to, the outline of my talk. First of all, um, I'd like to present some fundamentals of physics and solid state physics. I'm, very well aware of that um, all students certainly are acquainted with all the details um, of these four points that I'm listing here. But just to get in phase again, um, that we have some common grounds, I'll first very briefly introduce the very basic laws of quantum dynamics of quantum physics. I'll proceed to introduce and um, corroborate the second law of thermodynamics on Saga's reciprocal relation, which is very important, um, and then Rajpa's spin orbit coupling that occurs at interfaces. Um, this, um, in particular, the first three items here really form the bedrock of a, a lot of science today, not only physics. Based on this, in particular on the Rajpa effect, I'll go on and in the second part of my lecture, present nano devices, and this may actually just be simple wires, mesoscopic wires, in which electrons move with different velocity depending on the direction in which they are going. So they may be going along the wire quickly in one direction and slowly in the other. 
which seems very, very unusual, um, but um, this seems just to be true and a property of these interfaces. Then I'll go ahead and extend this wires, add some additional physics, and show that uh, based on these devices, one can actually conceive quantum devices in which the electrons move with different probabilities in the opposite direction, so that a wire has a different resistance for electrons going in one direction than for electrons going in the other direction. And because this happens for individual electrons already, this is occurring in linear response and thereby actually does not follow Onsaga's reciprocal relation, which is supposed to be valid for essentially everything. And I'll also show, as I mentioned already, that this effect extends well beyond interface physics and is a universal phenomenon in nature, which I think has been overseen up to now. Based on this, I'll go ahead and show that um, these devices actually expose, at least if you didn't make any big mistake, if you're right, that there is a conflict in the bedrock of um, this um, of, of physics here, namely that the laws of quantum dynamics, that quantum physics actually is in some contradiction with the second law of thermodynamics. Um, this will be the part four of my talk. Okay, and please feel free to interrupt me anytime. This is a lecture and um, I'm, I'm used to interruptions. Okay, let's, yeah, and by this doing so, I'll diligently follow the guiding principle of the famous mathematician John Conway, who actually passed away a few weeks ago due to um, corona. Um, so it's certainly a good idea that we're not together in Le right now. He said, always go multiple steps beyond what any reasonable person would do. So that's the motto for this morning. Um, and I'll start by acknowledging the um, collaboration and the um, very helpful input and, and scientific insight of my collaborators in this project. Um, Daniel Braag, Philipp Bredol, who is a PhD student with us, Hans Boschka, and also Thilo Kopp from the University of Augsburg, and of course also to many, many other helpful colleagues um, with which we had discussions over the last several years on these topics. Okay, and I'll get started now with the fundamentals and um, first of all with the laws of quantum dynamics. Quantum physics says that the state of the system is encoded into the wave function of the system, into the psi. And we know very well how to calculate how psi develops in time. First of all, um, in the non-relativistic case, and I'll only focus on non-relativistic problems today, um, the Schrodinger equation describes exactly how the wave function evolves with time. Um, here it's written down, and um, the Schrodinger equation says very much simplified the following. Um, here we have the Hamilton operator, the, the, energy of, the energy operator of the system. If we have a wave function and we decompose it into the eigenfunctions of the Hamilton operator, so in the eigenfunctions I call phi n, all what is happening is that these individual components um, of the, this phi n, these eigenfunctions, change by rotating their phase with time, and that's all what is happening here. Um, so, in, um, according to the Schrodinger equation, nothing actually happens in um, quantum mechanics. There is no event. It's, it's just a rotation of the phases with time. Um, it's, it's a very boring situation. And because the time propagation here is um, described by um, a unitary operator, um, so e to the um, in, with the h in the exponential. Um, this physics is also just unitary physics and I'll refer to it in my lecture today as the unitary evolution in quantum mechanics. This behavior is of course completely reversible. There's no time breaking here. The time reversal symmetry is obeyed. That's very important. And this type of 
evolution of the uh, of, of quantum states is what is used in superconducting electronics, for example, and also in what people are trying to use in quantum computing using qubits. So they focus completely on this evolution of the states and try to use this evolution of all this quantum states simultaneously to do quantum computation. Now, you know that at least up to now, they have not been super successful. And that is because this physics is not the only physics. There is also a second process, which they refer to the quantum computing people as decoherence. Um, in experimental physics, we refer to it as measurement. Um, one could also describe it as in the, was done in the old days of quantum mechanics, collapse processes. What is this? Well, as you know, um, in the end of, of um, say, an experiment, um, one would like to measure the outcome um, of, to, to obtain an experimental result. Um, and if one does such a measurement, um, what is happening, one uh, projects the wave functions into the eigenfunctions of a measurement operator. Um, and after this um, measurement, the wave function, or with this measurement, the wave function actually changes um, and becomes one of the eigenfunctions of um, the measurement operators. So this projection on an eigenstate um, is also called wave function reduction. So here we have a unitary evolution of the wave function. Here we have a projection of the wave function um, by the measurement or let's say by some incoherent process. Now, this step here is not unitary anymore. Um, although many argue that the underlying physics still comprises a lot of unitarity, the step itself mathematically is non-unitary. So I'll refer to this measurement process, to this projection process as non-unitary evolution. And um, the title of my talk is Non-Unitary Quantum Electronics, meaning that we're using this non-unitary evolution added in addition to the quantum um, evolution here as described by the Schrodinger equation. Now this step, this um, reduction process is essential for the Bond's rule, you know, um, obtaining the transition probabilities and so on, and Fermi's golden rule, which is widely used in quantum physics and um, um, is, has been found to be perfectly valid today. And it's very interesting to note that this step, of course, breaks the time reversal symmetry in contrast to the Schrodinger equation. And that during this reduction step, as you can see here, information on this AN and on the phases of this AN, the AN are complex numbers, is lost. So there's some information lost, in erasure of information in this step. There's a lot of interpretation, what is going on there. There are many different models and many camps in science and physics fighting about the correct interpretation of quantum physics. This morning, definitely, I'd like to stay out of it, um, but just mention that for us and the way we describe it, we use it in, in our work, the measurement actually is not necessarily a measurement where a person with a PhD in physics is taking some measurement and then the wave function collapses. Now it just evolves in our understanding by coupling a quantum system to the macroscopic world which is the source of the problems of the quantum commu computer community here, or by coupling a quantum system to a continuous density of states, which may happen, for example, if a nucleus, a radioactive nucleus decays, say with an alpha decay, there's this decay event before we had the undecayed nucleus, afterwards the nucleus is decayed, and what is happening is that the alpha particle as it leaves the nucleus Cup has access to a continuum in the density of states um, in its um, energy distribution, in its momentum distribution, um, so that at least in our understanding, at this point one can say that, you know, as the alpha particle leaves, the nucleus has already decayed. So this is 
essentially what we understand by measurement. Okay, so this for quantum physics. Next step, the second law of thermodynamics, which goes back a very long time to into the mid 19th century to the work of Rudolf Clausius, 1815 and Lord Kelvin. Um, they were considering thinking about you know, the science, the physics of steam engines and how to get them to get them to work most efficiently. There's been the work of uh, Carnot before. Um, and they, um, of course, realized that there is a tendency in nature that the entropy um, of um, in, in such processes just increases with time um, or stays at best constant with time. Um, of course, one tried, one, uh, people try to understand the, the essential mechanism behind it and um, going away from fire and steam to um, statistical physics, um, the following arguments were presented for this increase of the entropy as a function of time. How can it be? Because the underlying um, mechanics is certainly uh, time reversible and here we have a, a, a proven time reversal symmetry. Well, um, the reason that the entropy increases as a function of time um, actually is twofold. First of all, it's pure statistics. So imagine a container, a box, as I've shown here, um, where we have a diaphragm with some holes and uh, particles, say little balls or molecules, we I assume here that they are distinguishable, are put on one side of, of uh, this diaphragm. So in this case, we just have one way to distribute the particles here on, on the left-hand side, you know, having all six um, balls here on the left-hand side. Um, corresponds to a low entropy. There's only one configuration, one microstate that corresponds to the six to zero distribution. In contrast, if you have three balls on the left-hand side, three balls on the right-hand side, um, there are many more possibilities to obtain um, this type of distribution. You know, we, we could swap, for example, these two balls um, um, and uh, because we have a large number of possible microstates, we have a higher entropy and therefore one, um, because there are larger possible realizations of these configurations, this is more likely. So this certainly is an underlying reason for the validity of, of the second law of thermodynamics, but this cannot be the complete reason why the second law is um, valid or is supposed to be valid because this argument here just says um, in such a distribution with a higher entropy we have more states that are can be occupied than here so in essence it just says nature is more likely to develop in a manner that is more likely that, that's a tautology there's not much science behind it so there must be something more. And that there is something more is the fact that one assumes here tacitly that all these different microstates have the same probability of occupancy. And this was in some sense first pointed out by Maxwell. And um, when he invented um, the so-called Maxwell demon, he said, Look, um, if you have a system here um, where we have a trap door and um, he introduced a little being, a little intelligent being, um, and he, he proposed that if this being was able, for example, to measure the velocity of this incoming balls here to this door and to open the door only if fast balls uh, want to go from the left to the right, or slow balls want to go from the right to the left, um, then after some time one would have a hot 
system here on the right side and a cool system here on the left side, and that would violate the second law of thermodynamics. Or equally, you know, if such a demon would be able to uh, function in a manner that balls would preferably move from the left side to the right side, as compared from the right side to the left side, we also would end up with an unequal distribution of particles on the right and to the left, and we could use the pressure difference between both sides to violate the second law of thermodynamics. So Maxwell pointed this out. Um, his reason was for doing so was he just wanted to point out that the second law of thermodynamics as compared to the first law is of a pure statistical nature. But his argument here also shows that maximum uh, such a demon is actually not possible to be realized because otherwise the second law of thermodynamics would be violated. If it existed, we could come up with a scheme to extract from a uniform heat bath thermal energy and do some work, which of course would be wonderful, <laughs> in particular in the days today um, with the global heating. Um, but this apparently does not work. And um, so people started to wonder why this doesn't work. And they, many actually try to build such systems. The first um, attempts to um, build such Maxwell demons used, of course, mechanics, you know, little uh, contraptions where the door actually was supposed to be opened and closed. Um, and it was generally found that this, or always found that these devices do not work. And the reason is that also these doors that are supposed to open and work have to be at the same temperature than the overall system. So also these doors are subject to thermal fluctuations and they are not completely therefore closed or not completely opened. They are sort of in an equilibrium and in the end they cannot do any sorting. This problem has been very well pointed out by Feynman, by Richard Feynman in his textbook. And there's also a nice video on YouTube, um, which I recommend just to watch where he explains why these devices do not work. Of course, Maxwell's principle that these demons cannot work applies to all types of demons, not just mechanical devices. So there must be a more general principle behind it why these demons cannot work. You know, it's just not allowed by whatever scheme that these work. And the first one to realize that there must be a much more important principle behind it was Leo Szilard. Here he is, he's the person who actually also invented the nuclear chain reaction. And he proposed actually a demon that would work, a very nice scheme with a single molecule in, in, in such a, a system um, with two chambers and a piston in between. And he traced it down and looked and, and he realized, well, the demon who is supposed to open or close the doors actually needs to acquire the information about the incoming balls and he needs to process the information to decide, oh, I now should open the door or close it. And Leo Stila pointed out that this process of acquiring and in particular processing information costs energy and it costs more energy or produces more entropy than the demon actually in the end could generate. So this was a very general argument in 1929. It was extended later by Prior and Gabor, who pointed out and analyzed that the measurement process, you know, what type of particle is coming in? Is it from the left, from the right? Is it hot? Is it cold? Costs energy. Now, in the 1960s, Rolf Landauer, who was working at IBM in Yorktown Heights, um, considered thought about the minimum need or uh, the minimal energy needed for computers, IBM computers, to do computations. And um, he understood, and this is very well accepted, that actually computations can be done without any minimal energy needed. So 
computations in computers can in principle be done reversible. There's no minimum energy expenditure for doing some computation. Oops, that's bad news for Leo Szilard. But Landau also pointed out that actually in the end, if a computation has been done, to erase the information, to erase the state of the computer, that costs energy which is easy to understand if you think about it because the information during the process has to be stored in deep energy wells and if you want to erase it, it costs some energy and costs some entropy. Now, Oliver Penrose in 1970 and Charles Bennett in 1982 made then the connection to Leo Szilard's argument and said, ah, okay, that's the reason why maximal demon cannot work. It's not the processing of the information, but the demon, if it works, it stores, it has to store information during the process and erasing this information actually generates more entropy or at least the same amount of entropy than the demon actually could win or, or could uh, beneficially produce during um, his action. And this is the um, reason that is widely accepted today um, why a demon that would violate the second law of um, thermodynamics cannot work. In quantum photonics, um, this is actually used um, and, and, and there are many very beautiful experiments where demons have been built that um, actually uh, generate work, but they do so while they're still storing the information um, inside the demon. This community calls such demons demons, although they don't violate the second law of thermodynamics, because in the end, if their information content is erased, um, then everything is still consistent or is, is consistent with the second law, okay? This argument, of course, has the implicit assumption that a demon actually has to be some intelligent being um, which opens and closes this door, that the demon actually needs to process information. So the conclusion from this point is that cannot, the strict conclusion, there cannot be an intelligent demon. But, you know, it may very well still be possible that there is um, some just physics phenomenon that produces such a sorting or, or, or such a process um, that does not need to process information. Okay, next step. On Saga's reciprocal relations. What is this about? Well, Lars Onsager, here he is. He asked himself the question, how does a thermodynamical system respond to a disturbance? That seems something completely different, but you'll see that it goes along the same line. So he starts with a, considering a general thermodynamic system, a, say a, a container with gas again, or a, a solid and um, electrons distributed in this solid, or uh, um, electron density distributed in this solid. Now, he characterized, he started to characterize the system by a set of parameters, alpha e, um, which describe the displacements of mass and energies and, and, and um, from the standard equilibrium position. So these alpha e's characterize how much the system, for example, um, the pressure at one point deviates from the standard thermal equilibrium um, alpha 2 may be the electrostatic potential uh, differing from the standard um, equilibrium. So he's asking himself, if I plot here all this alpha t, um, this is the thermal equilibrium as a function of time, and I bring the system here out of equilibrium into a state A here, how does it relax back to equilibrium? That's of course a very important, very basic question. And he generated he had some really key insight how to solve this problem in a very elegant manner. He said, well, um, I just consider systems that are close to thermal equilibrium. And in this case, 
um, such states like the state A here are also generated not just by me pushing the system on purpose out of equilibrium, but just due to thermal fluctuations. Okay, so I can ask myself also, how does the system relax to equilibrium once it has reached this out of equilibrium state or, or this fluctuation due to a thermal fluctuation? Um, so to handle this situation, this somewhat simpler situation, he introduced the entropy deficiency of this uh, state here, which he called here S. And then he calculated the relaxation by assuming or by uh, considering that because this um, deviation is small, there's some force, which you call generalized force, which is given by the gradient of the um, entropy deficiency S versus this displacement, which generates then a flux um, of this um, properties here back to equilibrium. So there's a flux, for example, that brings back the electrostatic um, distribution to the equilibrium. There's another flux that brings back pressure de deviation to the equilibrium and so on. And um, he makes two assumptions. First of all, um, the system that I push on purpose here into A goes back in the same way as the system that has reached this uh, point A by means of a fluctuation. Um, and second, um, this process, if you look at it from fluctuation wide, is of course time reversible. You could flip this curve of the fluctuations and, and you would not see, uh, you, you could not say, okay, this is forward time, this is backward time. Doing so, he immediately, it's a straightforward calculations, realized that for small fluctuations, so in linear response, this um, relaxation currents, this generalized fluxes, um, are just linearly dependent on these generalized forces, these gradients, for example, of temperature, electrostatic potential, or chemical potential. Um, so this I, this index I here, or, or the index J here, refers to the type of disturbance or the type of current, um, whether it's now a, temper a gradient in the temperature or a gradient in the electrostatic potential. And this matrix sigma ij here has to be symmetric, um, which is just uh, comes from the time reversal symmetry of the problem, as, as he pointed out. So sigma i J has to be the same as sigma J i. This means that if you, for example, um, introduce a temperature gradient in a system and there is a electric current induced by this temperature gradient, this um, conductivity that relates both is the same as the conductivity that describes how large a thermal current is induced by a difference in the, or by a gradient in the electrostatic potential. So there is um, this cross correlation coefficients between the forces and, and the fluxes are symmetric. They of course depend on the um, frequency or maybe frequency dependent, of course, we have to take it into account. If, we, if the whole process takes place in the presence of a magnetic field, also the magnetic field has to be flipped to be consistent with the time reversal symmetry. And likewise, if this current is, respond, is a response due to a, a vector, say to a, a, a wave vector, one also has to reverse the sign of the wave vector. So there's a special case, namely that J equals I. So we apply, for example, an uh, electrostatic uh, potential gradient and look for an electric current. So in this case, it turns out that in particular, if B equals zero, um, that the conductivities are independent of the direction of the wave vector, which means that if you have a wire, a conductor, what any, anything you can think about, in linear response, the conductivity in one direction has to be the same as the conductivity in backward direction very generic, just going back to these arguments that I've shown here. Um, you'll say, oh, of course, um, 
This cannot be because I know that we have in electronics diodes where the conductivity or the resistance certainly is directional dependence. Yes, that's true, but they don't work in linear response. If you look exactly at the properties of say a silicon diode, close to the origin at very small currents and voltages, it's linear as described here. No way around it. This principle applies to a huge uh, number of phenomena in science and I've listed them here. So including chemistry and biology, diffusion, thermoelectricity, and this is very widespread. And because it's so fundamental, um, Lars Onsager was given the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for this in 1968 because it allowed a complete description of irreversible processes um, in linear response or for small disturbances. And to my knowledge, or to our knowledge, um, all systems you know, in linear response that are known up to today um, follow this Onsager's relation. Okay? Next step. The Rushbar effect now interfaces ender. Okay, consider an interface, say an, an oxide interface, um, say a quantum well here, in which electrons can move. And in these interfaces, in this oxide interfaces, very frequently they are built in electric fields, as for example, um, very well described yesterday in the beautiful talk of Ralph Claesen. You know, this could be LAO, STO, um, the electron here moves at, at this interface. Now, if an electron with a spin moves with a velocity V in an electric field here generated by this, um, for example, polar catastrophe, um, the moving electron will experience this electric field as a magnetic field, as you know. And this magnetic field couples to the spin of the electrons and therefore to the energy of the electron. And this is the so-called Rushbar effect. The Rushbar effect is very important in solid state physics. And usually um, you, it, it, it is described, um, it's typically shown with this dispersion relation of the electrons. So um, one has this parabolic dispersion relation of electrons, of course, and um, due to the rush by effect, the paraboloids of the spin up, say this electron and the, this parabola, and uh, the spin down, this paraboloid, are just offset here by a, a certain amount, which is controlled or given here by this rush bar constant small alpha. This is essentially proportional to the built in electric field here. Okay. Now, in my lecture today, for the effects I'd like to present to you, we're looking at this effect at a slightly different angle, namely in the angle that it's not so horribly <laughs> important, okay? Um, we consider that in addition here to this Rushbar effect, there's also an applied external magnetic field that also couples to the spin of the electrons. And we assume that this is the relevant, the, the main energy scale here of the problem. Okay, so what will happen? Let's start here just with an innocent um, band structure, electrons spin up, spin down, without rush by effect and without applied magnetic field. We have the a parabolic energy dependence, so we just have one spatial direction, say the x direction, um, and the standard parabola that you know very well from solid state um, causes. If we now apply uh, this large um, external magnetic field, we'll get the same uncoupling to the spins, spin up and spins down states. Um, in our case, if you apply the magnetic field in upward direction, the Electrons with spin up will have a lower energy than the electrons with spin down, and this offset is twice the same uncoupling energy here. Now, I assume that this magnetic field, this applied magnetic field, is very large, so we just move this band here away that we can forget about it. So the chemical potential just rests in the lower band. We have a spin polarized electron system, okay? Now we add the Rushbar effect. The Rushbar effect moves here both parabola and the interesting parabola here with the spin up electrons to the right hand side 
and the um, unoccupied states here to the left hand side. So we get a band structure as shown here and um, as uh, enlarged on, on this slide, which is somewhat uh, uh, an unusual and a little bit of weird band structure because um, the electrons here only occupy, first of all, states with positive wave vectors. Okay. Um, the electrons, of course, are still moving in both directions, and there is an equal number of electrons moving in forward direction, that's this slope here at the chemical potential, and in backward direction. You remember that the um, velocity, the, the, the group velocity of the electrons is given here by the slope of the dispersion relation. Okay. And the center, um, the minimum here of, of the band is um, provided by this rush bar coupling constant alpha. Now, if you look at it, you realize that there is something strange, namely that these forward moving electrons have a different absolute value of K than this backward moving electrons. K, of course, <laughs> is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So these electrons have a different de Broglie wavelength than that electrons. Imagine that an electron moving this way, say with a velocity of well, 10 to the four meter per second, um, has a wavelength of four nanometers and the electron moving backward with the same velocity, 10 to the four, has a wavelength of two nanometers. That's weird. And we decided to look into this and, and think whether this could be useful for devices. I mean, this, this is strange. And can we use it to have some fun? Yes, we can. Now, to, that this effect shows up in a device, one has to uh, compare this wavelength, which corresponds to a phase shift, to um, a second evolution of the electrons um, with a different wavelength because um, absolute phases cannot be measured. One can only measure phase differences, so we need a standard for comparison. And for this, we uh, started by shunting such a rush bar conductor drawn here in, in pink, just with a standard boring conductor, say a standard copper line or silver line or, or, or whatever, okay? Um, so we have this two in, shunt and, and as drawn here, they, they, they make a, a nice circular loop. Here are the contacts A and B. And uh, we have the situation that the, an electron moving from A to B here has um, a wavelength lambda zero in the boring conductor, but a wavelength uh, giving by its uh, by, by this equation, so with plus the rush bar coupling constant, um, while an electron moving downward um, has the same um, wavelength in, in, in this boring conductor, but um, this wavelength in the rush bar conductor. Now, this means that an electron moving from A to B at that point experiences a different type of interference than an electron moving from B to A. And as you'll see, um, it's readily possible that um, we can achieve configurations that an electron that moves from A to B constructively interferes here, an electron moving from B to A destructively interferes here. That's bizarre. So the direction of travel affects the interference in these devices, which have a non-central symmetry. Um, let me point out that there has been a very nice review on non-reciprocal responses from non-central symmetric quantum materials by Yoshi Tokura and Naoto Nagaosa, um, which, which I can recommend here. Okay. Now, um, at that point, I'd like to leave the interfaces, come to the second um, part of the lecture, and um, look how these devices actually behave. And let me first point out, that's the step where we leave the interfaces, that this physics, this type of 
the behavior of these non-central symmetric devices is not only caused by the Rushba effect, but is far more general. Um, this was pointed out by Thilo Kopp. You see it here if you write down the Rushba Hamiltonian in, in that manner. The Rushba coupling constant enters the same way as the vector potential Q a um, multiplied by the charge Q. So this configuration that we just found um, is, shows the same behavior, very related behavior, like a um, ring made out of any material, so gallium arsenide or gold, that is just asymmetric, as shown here. Okay? And is um, in the presence of an applied magnetic field A. Now, what, 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 what is happening? Well, in that case, I've just done the calculation here. We can also um, achieve the situation, of course, that we get destructive interference in one way and constructive interference in the other way. Such a behavior of devices has been observed, noted many years ago in optics um, and created there quite some confusion um, before it was resolved. And it's known in optic as Rayleigh's paradox. Um, if you are interested, you, you, you can look it up. We are doing the same with um, electrons. Now, what, what is happening in this case? Well, um, let's look at the situation that an electron moves from A to B. And we've designed the geometry in the applied magnetic field such that this electron as it moves upwards, splits into two halves, and these two halves then arrive here with a, the same phases, so, or, or with a phase shift um, of n times, n times two pi. Then there is constructive interference at that point, and the electron immediately can leave through port B here. An electron that comes from port B, the wave function also splits into two halves, these two halves arrive here with a phase shift of a phase difference of pi. So they cannot leave. And the only thing that can happen is that this electrons halves here or the wave function halves continue to move again back to B. If they do so, they, meet, they move in, in this direction from A to B. So they pick up an additional um, phase difference of, of 2 pi, that, that is a multiple of 2 pi, and arrive again here with a phase difference that is odd. So also here they um, cannot leave because um, there's destructive interference. So they have to go on again and, and repeat this uh, loop a third time, come back, pick up yet a, an additional phase difference of pi, and then arrive finally here with an equal phase difference, uh, with a phase difference of n times 2 pi, so that now they can leave here at port A, okay? So we have the situation that an electron going from A to B just moves upward and leaves, and an electron coming from B and once going to A moves downward, is reflected, moves upward, is reflected, and moves downward. That will be essential for the rest of the lecture. And therefore, to convince you, um, we have done the following. We have solved the Schrodinger equation exactly for this configuration. So by direct diagonalization, um, generated electrons as wave packets. And what you see here in this slide, in, in, in this movie, is an electron that is moving here to this loop which is slightly asymmetric, but, but the asymmetry is so small that you can barely see. There's an applied magnetic field that we get this effect that we like. Um, and plotted here is the absolute value of the electron wave function. So this is what happens to an electron that moves from A to B. So it approaches the ring, it splits, the two halves pick up no phase difference in that case, and the electron then leaves here to port B. Okay, this is what we would have expected. Yes, standard electron propagation. Now comes the electron moving the other way. This is what the Schrodinger equation says. So the electron comes, arrives, acquires a phase shift of pi. Whoop. 
Oops, cannot leave, goes back. Oops, cannot leave, goes back. And finally leaves, okay? So this has to happen. This is what Schrodinger says. No way around it, okay? That's numerically exact. So the electron takes a different time to pass through this ring. And in the BA direction, this is three times longer than in the AB direction. It's a huge effect. If you look at it, you realize, hey, actually, we don't need this loop. Um, you know, this, this must be a very general phenomenon. But before I explain this, let me show to you that um, the behavior that we just seen and where, where we have the impression that the electron takes a longer time, um, of course, shows up also if we plot the probability that the electron reaches the final terminal as a function of time, you measured in femtoseconds. Um, so you see here the electrons moving from A to B, reach B essentially at that point, Opsa. The electrons moving from B to A reach it, their terminal at a much later time, and there's this big time difference in between. There's also part of the electrons that are reflected, so that come from B and are reflected back to B, and electrons that are reflected from coming from A back to A, um, they have the identical time evolution. But otherwise, the time symmetry is here broken. So we have devices with a fast forward but a slow backward electron transmission. Note here also that the probabilities for the electrons to finally in the end integrate it from going to A to B are exactly the same as going from B to A. So Onsago's relation here is beautifully observed. Okay. Now you can think about other shapes where this effect might happen. You don't need loops, as I just said. Let's just look, for example, at a device as, as shown here. Um, you can imagine that if an electron here arrives from this end, it may get reflected with some extent here at this phase. An electron that comes from this side may get reflected at um, this different phase, at this angled phase. These reflections may differ so we would expect also in this case a different time evolution in that case for at least for the reflected electrons and um, so we also solved the Schrodinger equation for this and what you see is here an incoming electron from the left side you see here the interference effects they are very complicated part of the electron passes through part of the electron gets reflected and if you look at the electron coming from the other side you immediately realize that these interferences, of course, are different than in the first case, and the time evolution is different, so that the time reversal symmetry and the transmission speed, the reflection speed, sorry, um, differs in that device also. And this is very general, so we see this phenomenon in a, a huge variety of devices. It, it's a very generic property of nature, which, to my knowledge, has been overlooked in the past, so not only in these asymmetric rings or in, in, in this arrow-shaped devices, you can also have such a kink here. In that case, you need to apply a magnetic field or you can have a straight line with, say, two tunnel junctions that have different height or uh, an asymmetric well or, or whatever. In all cases, this will happen. Um, and this here are just plots um, of this time evolutions. And to save time, I don't go into detail in here. Just to point out that if the device is symmetric, as shown here on the right-hand side, everything is perfectly um, symmetric. A and B and B and A for the transmission and for the re reflection are exactly the same as it should be. So the control experiment, so to say, works. Okay. Now, this effect that I described that the time evolution differs in one direction as compared to the other direction extends, of course, very much beyond this nano devices for electrons. This is a very generic property of scattering in general. And let me just point this out here with, with that slide. So it occurs in linear response, and it's completely consistent with Onsage because it does not affect the probabilities, it affects just the time evolution. 
Um, so the scattering probabilities are the same in forward and backward direction. But this time delay is differ. And that has been analyzed first um, by Wigner um, for standard scattering in um, high energy physics and nuclear physics. Um, he, he introduced the term of the Wigner, uh, uh, the, this time delay is called Wigner time delay. So we expect that this time delay also, for example, shows up in chemical reactions, in redox reactions. Imagine that's a little bit like our nanowires here, that two molecules arrive, you know, with the wave functions of the electrons and one electron is transferred from this molecule to that molecule. If this is described in a unitary process by the Schrodinger equation, and um, so there's no reason why the forward time and the backward time evolution should be the same. So um, we claim that in such reactions, actually, um, the speed of the reaction of this unitary reaction depends um, on the direction in which the reaction takes place. Takes place in scattering, as pointed out by Wigner. Um, in ballistic transport, as I described, of course, for all varieties of particles, it must not be only electrons, it could be in neutrons or alpha particles or whatever. Um, it refers to the transport of charge, energy, spin. In nanostructures, of course, also in molecules, in crystal lattices with the right asymmetries, in, in molecules, um, in artificial superlight, in heterostructures, as shown by Rolf Clayson uh, with examples yesterday, so in tricolor superlattices, in ratchet structures, and so on. Okay? Now we come to the third part, where we look at devices where not only the velocities differ depending on the direction, but also the probabilities where we really come into clinch with Onsager and probably also with Maxwell. Let's see what is happening now. So what we are doing now is we add to the Schrodinger equation here um, a measurement process. So now we also um, add this ingredient here to our devices. And this we do by adding inelastic scattering into our nano devices. And inelastic scattering is very well known to lead to losses um, of the wave, um, of, of the phase of the electron wave function. This is what the qubit people actually hate. So, Inelastic scattering can take place in a large variety of ways. And I just pick one example for clarity. And that is that we take, say, a semiconductor and, and an electron is supposed to travel ballistically in the semiconductor. But in the semiconductor, at one point, we had a defect, an impurity. Say, um, a cadmium electron with an energy level deep inside the band gap um, into which this electron can get trapped. Okay. This is very well known in semiconductor physics. So what will happen? So the electron here, say silicon at 4.2, um, travels in the conduction band um, and um, arrives here, approaches here, this impurity in the gap. This is the same scene from top here. You see the silicon atoms. And we consider the case that we just have a single particle that everything is very well shielded. Um, it's just standard single particle physics, and that the silicon is a macroscopic system so that it has 10 to the 21, 10 to the 23 atoms, then it's macroscopic, okay? And it has phonons and all this stuff. So what will happen? Well, the electron comes and is caught by this impurity. So it loses its momentum, it comes to a halt, it loses um, its energy, which is coupled out as a phonon into this lattice, and its phase memory is erased. Once the electron sits here, it doesn't know anymore um, what its phase here was, what its quantum phase here was. Actually, it doesn't even know anymore whether it came from the left or from the right or, or whatever. So the electron sits here. That corresponds to a measurement process. This is very similar like what is happening in your USB stick or in, in the flash memory of your cell phone. You store information as electrons trapped in impurities um, in that case embedded into transistors. And that's of course something classical. The electron really sits there. This is not anymore in a quantum coherent state. Your USB stick is no quantum computer. You know, if you store the address of your friend in your USB stick, 
um, it, it's really there as a stored information. It's not in a coherent superposition anymore, you know, with all addresses of all your other friends. The, the state here has really collapsed. It has been projected in, into this point, okay? Now, what will happen? Well, we are at a finite temperature and um, at some point, the phonons here in, in the silicon, the, there will be a fluctuation and then we'll kick this electron loose from the impurity. So the electron will be freed and it will leave the impurity and depending on the phonons that kicked it out, may leave to the right or may leave to the left or may leave simultaneously to the left and to the right as a spherical wave or whatever. In any case, it has this process now, it's no connection anymore to the original motion of the electron before it got trapped, okay? And the same thing happens, of course, for electrons coming from the left or for electrons coming from the right, okay? Now, if you look at it, we have a complicated situation now, really, um, and, and a very exciting, interesting one, because we have everything together now, you know, all mixed together in one experiment. We have wave packets, non-central symmetry, um, this unitary evolution and the Schrodinger equation um, obeys time reversal symmetry. Um, and we have wave function reduction. We have inelastic scattering centers, which couple to a thermal bath, described by the Baum rule. The probability that the electron is caught is nonlinear, a nonlinear function. So the phases here are really become important. The phases in, in the electron wave function, the phase memory is erased and time reversal symmetry is broken. If we just add such an inelastic scattering center into our ring, and we do it in a manner, this is the largest fun, such that we just have essentially one scattering center inside the ring so that the inelastic mean free path is comparable to the circumference of the ring, okay? We don't have 10,000 inside or we don't have one over 10,000 inside, it's about one order of one. Now, what will happen? This is now really strange. Look, um, typically one would simply argue the following way. One would say, okay, um, the whole thing is described by an inelastic mean free path, which describes the phase coherence length of the electron. That's the mean length scale over which the electron loses its phase memory. For an electron moving this fast direction, this short direction, the actually length of its trajectory is smaller than this inelastic mean free path, than this phase coherence length. So this process is mostly ballistic. The electron coming from A does not forget where it wants to go to and leaves at B. In most cases, there's some scattering, but let's neglect this at that point. In contrast, in that configuration where the electron goes down here, um, it has a much longer trajectory in the ring, it's three times longer. So this can be longer than this phase scattering length. So this process is much more diffusive and the electron therefore much more forgets where it needs to go to. Um, and so therefore a larger number of these electrons actually is reflected back here into B, which would violate Onsarkel's rule and which also looks strange in terms of maximal demons because it means that the Conduct more electrons coming from A reach B than electrons coming from B reach A in linear response. That's weird. So we cannot just leave it at this very simple argument. Let's try to understand it in more detail. Let's look at it microscopically. Now, what is happening to the wave packets? Well, they just get scattered at these specific points because that's where we put this inelastic scattering centers. So, what is happening, the electron here coming from A splits up, passes this inelastic scattering center once, has a, some probability to be scattered here, say 10%, um, then leaves with 90% probability here at B. Those that get scattered with 10% probability leave with 50-50 chance at A or at B. So here the backscattering probability is 5%. In that case, on the right hand side, the electron passes this point three times, back, forth, 
uh, fourth back fourth. So three times 10%, three times 5% backscattering. So the electron here has a higher probability, three times higher actually, or almost three times higher of being backscattered. So can this be? That, that, that's really strange. The argument seems healthy, but we wanted to convince ourselves and therefore we asked the computer actually um, to calculate this. Um, and for this, we um, developed the following um, calculational routine. We just look at in electrons that we send through these rings, calculate the trajectories, the Schrodinger equation by using a type binding model, you know, using a Gaussian wave packet. Um, so solve the Schrodinger equation exactly, neglecting electron-electron interactions. So, so we just consider individual electrons. That's what we want to have anyhow. We also neglect elastic scattering. That's for the unitary evolution. I think that's as good as you can do. Then we have this projection events here called collapse events, um, where we describe the, this, this capture by a stochastic process. So the computer just does Monte Carlo to calculate whether the electron should um, or, or is likely to, to be caught by this defect. And then it's um, projected down by the Bonn rule um, um, into the eigenstate here of, of this trapping site. Um, we've used several models for this. Um, then the electron is freed again um, um, and allowed to move with the unitary evolution. And then in case um, the computer decides, okay, that um, or, or Monte Carlo decides that there is yet another collapse, another collapse will happen and the, then uh, another unitary evolution will take place until the electron has completely left the device. This is a calculational procedure, which I think is essential to understand the behavior of such devices, um, which has not been done in, in um, electronics to uh, nanoelectronics, um, as far as we know. It's fairly common in quantum optics, um, where it's called the quantum tra trajectory approach. So we are taking essentially the same approach of quantum optics and transport it to quantum electronics. Um, I have to say that we were um, not really uh, the smartest because we invented it and later saw that quantum optics people have done it. <laughs> so we are disappointed. Um, in any case, uh, that's what we do. Um, and here is a video um, what the computer is doing. So you see again the electron approaching here. Here is such a scattering center. The electron goes through the ring here in the long limit. So it's reflected here. It's backscattered. And now it got trapped here at the defect. It sits at the defect, gets freed again, and has forgotten, of course, where it came from. A new wave emerges, and it emerges to the left and to the right, um, as you can see here. Okay, let, let me show it to you again. Uh, so the electron comes, unitary evolution, Schrodinger equation, um, goes through the ring, it's the long trajectory, it lingers too long in the ring and it gets caught. Bah. And then it's freed again, a Gaussian wave packet emerges and the, it just then follows the Schrodinger equation again. Um, and the electron now leads to the left and to the right. And after the, the, this collapse, after this inelastic scattering, the electron has forgotten where it came from. Okay. Now, what does do this calculation say? Well, um, these are of course stochastic calculations because the computer calculates or, or, or does Monte Carlo whether the electron gets scattered at one point and then um, how it proceeds. So we did these calculations for um, about 10 million different electron, electron trajectories, electron fates. Um, and we did it as a function while varying the inelastic scattering time of the electrons. Okay. Of, we did it for a set of inelastic scattering times. What are the results? Well, they are shown in this plot here, which show the um, fate of electrons passing through such a device here, through such an arrow. These points here are points um, where um, the tight binding calculations here have been done. Okay, what, what are we seeing? 
Well, I'm plotting here the, on, on the x-axis the transmission probability. So the probability that an electron entering from A can leave or finally leaves at port B. Um, and here is this inelastic scattering time. So um, at that point, we have very large inelastic scattering time. So inelastic scattering is, will not take place um, with, a very like pro with, with a very high probability in that case. Here, the inelastic scattering time is very short. There will be many, many inelastic scattering events. So here is quantum physics. Here is classical physics. And in between, um, we have the time that corresponds to the transmission time of the electron through the ring. Let's see what is happening. Well, if you start in the completely, in the complete quantum regime, where we can neglect inelastic scattering, the electrons, all electrons behave the same way for such a device here. They have a probability of about 30% to go from port A to port B with 70% they are reflected back and all of them behave the very same way. Now, if we increase the scattering probability at one point, we um, reach the point where more and more electrons get inelastic scattering, scattered. And you see that then this whole um, function spreads out. This is actually the, the stochastic um, in, in the Bonn rule that you can witness here. So it, it, this is just the um, uncertainty of the quantum projection, what is going to happen here. So here we may have the case that an electron gets scattered once and afterwards it reaches say with 50% probability port A and with 50% probability port B. Um, there are also very few electrons that reaches port B with 80% probability. Okay, so we get this huge spread here and this very interesting fine structure, which I have no time to comment about. Now, then once we pass the, the case where we have individual scattering events, we have 10, 100, 1,000 events, the electron transport becomes classical. It becomes diffusive. We make the transition into the classical world. And you see that then there are only two possibilities for the electron to leave. It can only leave on the pod A or on the pod B with 100% probability. The, the electron behaves like a classical particle. So this here is a calculational procedure that makes this transition from the quantum physics to the classical physics, you know, without any change um, in, in the procedure. It's just depending on, on one parameter that is uh, varied in a very controlled manner. And you see here how the system goes from quantum mechanics through this um, inelastic scattering range here to the um, classical procedure. What does this mean? Well, it says that um, if you take here one time, say 10 to the minus 15 seconds, um, there's a distribution of the electrons going from the left to the right and so on. Um, so that there is a certain probability if you integrate all this up that an electron makes the path from A to B. How does it look in reverse direction? That's shown here. It looks different. So here you see, for example, that feature that doesn't show up in the forward direction. The, the whole device is asymmetric, so we should not be astounded. But the question is, of course, if you integrate things up for a given inelastic scattering time, is the probability in forward direction different from that in the backward direction? And this I've plotted here on the right-hand side. That shows what we call the sorting function, the difference in the probabilities going from A to B or from B to A. So Onsager says this has to be zero. No way around it. That's Onsager, very fundamental. And that's what we see. That's the plot. Again, this sorting function and on the y-axis we have the, this decoherence time, this inelastic scattering time. What are we seeing? Well, in the quantum mechanical regime, as it has to be, this is zero. There's no sorting. But then at the point where we have about one inelastic scattering event per transmission, this sorting sets in with a probability of a few percent. This is not allowed by Onsager. And as more and more scattering events take place, the whole thing averages out and in the end we reach classical physics, the sorting again disappears, again consistent with Onsager. So we get this non-Onsager behavior right at the transition between the 
quantum world and the classical world. This is really amazing. Yeah, um, this is just the control um, for a symmetric for a symmetric device here. Nothing special happened, um, so it, it really comes from the asymmetry. So we have here a non-reciprocal resistance in linear response, which is the first case of a non saga non on saga reciprocity, um, as I said. But this actually does not violate on saga. It doesn't follow on saga. But on saga, as I said, as I explained, starts with a time reversal system. And if we have this projections, as I also explained, we break time reversal symmetry, or nature breaks it intrinsically. So this is an exemption to on saga. It's not an exception. It's an exemption. Um, Yet it's a non onsaga system as has not been known before. Okay. Jorun, Jorun, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, um, can you try finishing in say five minutes or something like this to allow for questions? Yes, I will. Okay, thank you. So let me just say that this um, is an action in linear response, which is not achieved with standard PN diodes. The, the reason is very simple. It's, it's also sketched in this Venn diagrams. Um, so this is a new type of diet. It actually, it, it's working is uh, sort of illustrated in, in this comic here. It acts like a wall or like a, a membrane that lets particles through in one direction, but less in the other direction. So it's a membrane, a non-reciprocal, a non-symmetric membrane for particle transport. It's like a door that is halfway open if you want to go through in one direction, but only a third way open if you want to go in, in the other direction. How can this be? Well, um, this seems to be violating, you know, really very basic principles. But if one thinks about it, this is not really astounding. The reason is that we have, of course, classical physics and unitary quantum mechanics, which we both understand very well. Both are relying on um, the premises that I'm showing here. So in uh, classical physics, uh, one premise is that the whole physics is deterministic and we have um, time reversal symmetry of the microscopic laws. And in the Schrodinger equation, this is also deterministic and we have time reversal symmetry. Now the transition regime in between is very interesting. And this has been modeled in the past by blending both, by saying, okay, we know how these quantum rings have to behave if you add some scattering. It will just be unitary quantum mechanics with some resistance added as we know it from classical physics. Um, or by doing Kubo type formal um, descriptions. In our view, this is cutting corners because the physics is more complicated. We have in fact here the situation, um, you know, that we have a unitary evolution and that we have the stochastic processes. So in that case, if one looks at it microscopically, we have to take into account that the system here is non-deterministic and that it breaks time reversal symmetry. So this behavior cannot by principle be described by a mixture or by an extrapolation of either quantum physics or by classical physics. New phenomena are bound to show up here. And in particular, the laws in classical physics or the laws of quantum mechanics that are based on determinism and time reversal symmetry need not apply here because we break time reversal symmetry and we have, break, we have stochastic processes. So the, they may apply, but there's no reason why they have to. Okay, now we come to the final point. Schumacher will be relaxed. So the big question now is the following. We have these diodes, which act in linear response. Now let's hook these diodes up to just ohmic resistors, all in thermal equilibrium. These ohmic resistors will create Johnson noise or Nyquist noise as shown here. So if you have electrons here on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side in equal numbers, they will try to pass through our device. 
Now we have a preferred direction of travel. So what will happen according to our calculations, according to quantum physics, is that in the end we end up with more electrons on the right hand side. So this would violate the second law of thermodynamics. But unless we made a stupid mistake, which may very well be, of course, <laughs> that, that's perfectly possible. Um, otherwise, we have the problem that quantum mechanics strictly predicts that this will happen. And thermodynamics strictly says this is not allowed. So <laughs> we have a conflict between both. And this is an important conflict because it, re it, it goes it affects the, the very basics of science, of, of physics, and it would immediately also have important practical applications if such devices would work. Okay. Now, could it be? Well, this would be a Maxwell demon in, in the sense that it violates the second law. What about these arguments? Well, as I explained, these arguments say this demon is not allowed because it needs to erase information. But in our case, there's no need for information to erase information because quantum mechanics just says the electrons have to travel in such a manner. There's no little guy doing any measurements and doing any storage. There's no computer involved. It's just very basic principles. So these arguments against the behavior of a maximal demon do not hold water in, in our case. So in the end, let me point out that this phenomena which keep us excited now for a couple of years are not restricted to this um, nano devices as I described them but they result if our understanding is correct um, from this um, behavior of quantum physics that on the one hand we have um, the unitary evolution on the other hand we have the non-unitary part um, and um, in case this time scales um, um, uh, um, correspond to one inelastic event per uh, characteristic time scale of the device, such asymmetries will happen in chemistry, in photonics, and in particle physics, and so on. Um, and for example, we have a system, we have treated a system, a photonic system, um, which matches about the system that um, I've described. Um, where we can um, do a, a more or less exact calculation and we see that starting from standard thermal equilibrium, the system evolves in a manner that the entropy decreases as a function of time. So this brings me to the end of my talk. Non-unitary quantum electronics um, really, um, in our view, um, a very breathtaking um, devices at the edges of the quantum world. So if you like, at the interface between the quantum world and the, and the classical world, um, this utilizes the unitary evolution and the quantum state reduction of electron wave packets in succession. Um, the fundamental laws of science do not need to apply per se. We have to look into each one. And um, examples that I've treated are Onsager's reciprocal relations, Landau's relation principle, and the second law of thermodynamics. The devices you can think about, and I, I won't read this list, are uh, really plentiful, like new types of diets without any interfaces, my apologies. Um, and these devices expose very fundamental problem that quantum physics seems to contradict thermodynamics, which in the end I think is a question that has to be settled by an experiment that can be done in electronic systems or photonic systems and um, experiments that we propose here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joran, for this uh, beautiful presentation. And I'm especially happy to have followed it since I missed your talk at Stanford University in January. <laughs> uh, and the talk was about this. This, this is really fascinating. Uh, I don't know. I do not see at the moment questions. You can ask questions uh, using the chat and I will give you the word or you can ask a question directly. Maybe Jorn, I'll start with, with one. The key, okay, as I understand, the key to observe this asymmetry is to have um, uh, um, uh, a k-value which is different for electrons going in one way or the other way. 
to get, for instance, a phase difference of pi in one direction and two pi in the other direction. Is this, is this correct? So maybe my question is, what are the minimum requirements needed to observe such, uh, such effects? You, I think you said it, but this is really the most, probably most important thing. So the, this difference in the K values, what mm -hmm. you're saying is perfectly correct, um, applied to the Rajpa effect. Mm -hmm. um, but if we um, go to geometries where we don't need the Rajpa effect, this difference in the K values we don't need. Okay. okay. Um, what we need is um, non in, in such uh, nano um, devices, non central symmetry. You know, something like shown here or like shown here um, or um, such asymmetric tunnel barriers. Mm -hmm. That's all what is needed. So this could be devices out of silicon, out of, out of gold, out of, made out of aluminum. Um, and then uh, um, we definitely get, uh, um, th this devices definitely show an asymmetry in the time evolution. Um, of electron transport. So this is an effect that is going to show up also in electronics in the future as devices get smaller and smaller or um, you know qubit people will see it, will encounter it. Um, we suddenly get difference in, in the propagation times and the propagation speeds of electrons. Which also means that by shaping such nanowires, you know, making them sawtoothed or flat, one can change the propagation speeds of the electrons. But but if you if you I'm thinking now that if 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 I'm looking at your um, uh, uh, your device your ring device uh, you introduce an inelastic scattering center somewhere yeah. so yeah. can you imagine the same kind of experiments with a simpler uh, um, device like the one which shows this arrow for instance yeah yeah so um, the calculations that I showed you know this colorful plots here and the sorting functions were done for this arrow with a scattering center here embedded. So all you need is a non-central symmetric device mm -hmm. with some inelastic scattering, which in fact could also be phonons, mm -hmm. so scattering by phonons. So I think or, or we believe that these effects are fairly far spread. Um, it just requires inelastic scattering, phase breaking, and non-central symmetry or something equivalent. Okay, thank you, Joran. Uh, Mark, I, I think you have a question. Yes, um, it, it's a very uh, interesting uh, talk and uh, very challenging in some sense. But yeah, I was wondering about something. So. Um, you presented towards the uh, the end of uh, of your seminar this um, this chart which shows the uh, the different time scales from the uh, I would say quantum to the classical and in the intermediate regime somewhere there was this issue of of uh, having yes exactly having uh, this uh, unusual asymmetry between uh, uh, a to B and, and, and B to A. Uh, what I'm wondering is, um, in some sense, a system can have uh, different degrees of freedom. Uh, so let's say when we're talking about these different regimes, you can have momentum relaxation, energy relaxation, and other features. So could it be that this region, which you know is, is odd, um, corresponds to the fact that you have not fully relaxed one of these degrees of freedom. So, in, in, in the, for the um, um, for what you call the, uh, the 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 classical or the quantum uh, world, I mean, for the classical world, I would say uh, essentially uh, time, quote unquote is irrelevant, meaning everything is supposed to have fully relaxed with the uh, bats. And in the, in the quantum world, that's not the case. So I, I'm just wondering. So what we, 
So um, the the first part uh, to the different scales that are that, that, that may be involved or, or different phenomena that may happen, the the relevant um, effect is the um, loss of the face memory. So which of course is coupled to uh, momentum or energy relaxation, but but the loss of the face memory is what counts in the end. Um, what what we are having is um, a system that is in thermal equilibrium um, and we add one additional electron to the conduction band. We, we just assume that this is excited and look at the fate of this one electron. Um, and um, as it reaches this regime, it interacts with the system um, and the momentum and, 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 the, elect and, and the energy of, of the electron gets interchanged, of course, um, with the thermal bath. I'm not sure whether this answers your question. Um, well, essentially what I was trying to get at is the fact that, you know, when we discuss this uh, issue of, um, of um, I would say reversibility or irre irreversibility. So the, just in short, the uh, second law of thermodynamics versus anything else, um, this has to be in the context of an isolated system. If there is uh, any contact with some, you know, source, then, uh, okay, it doesn't. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, so, here, this isolated system, in terms of the second law, consists of the whole setup. So, these resistors that generate these electrons are coupled to the same thermal bath, they are at the same temperature, then the actual device and um, like the wires here. The whole thing sits on say a substrate um, with a macroscopic number of atoms as I described, which is part of this system, okay? And this macroscopic number of degrees of freedom of the substrate provides the possibility um, that the electron wave function actually is, is reduced, that, that we have um, a, 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 a reduction, um, a, a measurement process, a coupling to a macroscopic body. Okay, okay there was a, Mark, maybe there was a question of uh, Ingrid. Ingrid, you, you, you can ask your question. Hi, it's actually Gabriel. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Our daughter. Uh, okay. uh, I was curious, a very interesting talk, actually extremely inspiring. Uh, of course, uh, I, I seem to remember that there are also experimentalists around. And, and where, are we, where are we on the experiments? And in particular, I mean, the, the whole thing where trying to prepare single electrons to go through uh, you know, solid state systems is, is, is a bit of a challenge. And, and could you see any effects if you just do a conventional transport measurement, you know, where you measure, you know, we have some current, you know, source, which you can pulse on and off, not with, you know, not with individual electrons, but just some mean flux. I mean, what, what are the real effects that you would expect in an experiment? Yo, um, so first of all, as, as you can guess, we are doing these experiments at present. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Second, I, um, they are also not actually too complicated um, because in the end, what we do not need in the experiment is um, a, a controlled transmission of single well-defined electrons. We, we just need small currents, making sure that the electrons cannot interact but, but just small currents are, um, um, are fine. So there are two different varieties of experiments that can be done. One is um, taking such a device, 
hooking it up to a power supply to say a current source mm -hmm. um, which provides a, a conveniently small a suitably small current and just measure the conductance of the, the device the resistance of the device depending on the polarity just see whether the IV characteristic shows rectification even at very small um, bias currents. Does it? This is, that's one experiment. The other one is um, the one that I've, I'm plotting here to doing it um, with uh, thermal currents that are introduced here by Johnson noise. And of course, we have a control over the um, size of these currents here by varying the, the, the resistance here. So you're just measuring them, just essentially hooking this up and doing noise, essentially looking at conductance fluctuations, I mean, sort of, or noise. Yeah, and, and looking whether there is a, say, an offset of the voltage noise away from zero. So we're revisiting the universal conductance fluctuations, basically. Yes. And, and seeing that things are not. Checking uh, whether the universal conductance fluctuations are um, precisely centered at zero. Yes, yes. Okay, that's what I suspected. Okay, great. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, Johan, maybe maybe one more question. I mean, okay, you explained that that this effect, I mean, uh, is very general. Now, if you if you if you use it with electrons, like in this um, in this example, uh, and if you start accumulating electrons on one side, you will develop a bias. So, okay, yeah, I don't know. Can you comment on this? Yes, sure. That's precisely what is going to happen. If, if you are correct, if, if you're right, if you don't make a stupid mistake. <laughs> um, so, uh, if we start in thermal equilibrium, we'll have the equal number of electrons on the left side, on the right side. That's the boring situation, but this will be instable. Electrons will move preferentially to one side, as shown here, and this creates a bias. Um, and this bias, which is a, a voltage that also can measure, be measured from the outside, this bias leads to a backward drive, to, to an ohmic current of the electrons backward. Um, and at one point, an equilibrium will be reached between this current that is pumped forward by the device and this backward flowing device. So that it, it exponentially um, a, a certain voltage difference will be reached. Um, but this voltage difference, as I said, can be measured and is classically not allowed to exist. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. We can take two more questions because we are already over time. There is a question of uh, Jun Chen. Please go ahead and ask your question. And the last question will be from Gabriel. Jun, do you want to ask your question? I, I can ask the question if you cannot. Jomaki has a problem with, with his mic. He said. Oh, I see. Okay, so you want me to ask the question, Mark? Uh, let me see if I can. Please. Unblock. Yeah. Please ask. Okay, I will. <laughs> uh, okay, so the question is... Um, uh, could it, okay, sorry, yeah, yeah. could it be possible to realize a single phase material? Okay, I'm not sure I, I really understand the question. Uh, a real phase, a single phase material which is non-central symmetric? I'm not sure this is a question, but. Yes, um, then, um... That, yes, that, that's definitely possible, um, in particular with um, heterostructure growth with super lattices. Um, and um, this opens the door that one actually also grows materials that are non centrosymmetric and that contain such inelastic processes, um, which then would also affect the ground state, the, the, the possible ground states achievable by these materials. So this effect if you're right, if you're not mistaken, if you don't make a stupid mistake, um, would allow the creation of new, of novel electron systems, 
that are not achievable um, in, in other means. Yes? And I think I listed it at one, on, on one slide, uh, but I had no time to read through it. Thank you, Jorn. And the last question, Gabrielle, um, back to you. Yeah, so it's actually a question from me. Um, I'm Yonga. So um, what is the current level that you propose? You know, you said to send a very small amount of current to, so the electrons are non-interacting. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, what kind of uh, scatter do you have in mind for introducing uh, deliberately? So, you know, I suppose you want to do some control experiments where you know where you put your scatter. Do you have any such a uh, controllable scatter? Yeah. So with, with the current, the experimentally, the, the way to go is to do the experiments as a function of the amount of um, current bias, tuning the current, um, and seeing whether something changes um, as one um, goes to the as small currents as are possible to reach. And depending on, on the experimental setups, you know, this, this may be pico amps or whatever. The electron-electron interaction um, actually um, can be also reduced by the right choice of materials um, that one has um, more or less um, independent electron systems. The type of inelastic scatterers, um, they can be introduced artificially as defects. They could be, for example, grain boundaries. If one uses semiconductors, they could be dopants or defects that are introduced on purpose. Um, another possibility is um, just to use phonons, as I said already, they have the disadvantage that they are not well localized. So the scattering may happen anywhere, but that can be then considered in, in, in the modeling. They have the advantage that their density can be, of course, easily varied by changing the temperature. So that one has actually a, a handle on changing the inelastic scattering time simply by changing the, the temperature. So both are possible um, and um, we're actually trying to do both. Thank you, Joran. I think we will stop here. Um, it's time to go to the swimming pool. It's uh, Saturday. So Joran, um, thank you again for this really fantastic presentation. And as Gabriel said, very inspiring. Thank you very much. And I wish you all um, a very good day. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Happy weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.